Welcome to On the Road with Alan Ivey. My name is Al Hando, presenting literary essays, classic book talk, and humor for my works on Bella, Kindle Unlimited, and my blog on X. The Godfather by Mario Puzo, The Robin Hood Myth, and The Three Musketeers by Audrey Henry de Moss. The Godfather by Mario Puzo hardly needs introduction. It's a classic, and many of its characters and passages have entered into our folklore and vocabulary. It spawned two great films, and one pretty good one, and will be read by people a hundred years from now. The most famous phrase, it's not personal, just business, has popped up in many movies since as a standard phrase for gangsters and businessmen. We're often interchangeable. The character, Michael Corleone, who eventually becomes a new godfather, had a different take. He said, it's all personal, every bit of business. Every piece of shit, every man has to eat, every day of his life is personal. They call it business. Okay, but it's personal as hell. You know where I learned that from? The Don, my old man, the Godfather. It goes without saying that the story is filled with people who take things very personally. Rousseau's genius is the willingness to be a dispassionate narrator so that the reader gets a real feel for the mafia world and their value system. The Robin Hood myth is a similar situation. The story dates back to the 1300s and could have one of a few different origins, from the metaphysical to the revolutionary. The most common modern image is that of the brave archer who steals from the rich and gives to the poor. It goes without saying that the basic ethos to rob from the rich and give to the poor can hide a multitude of sins, which can include corruption and murder, which are all overlooked or forgiven if the right people are the victims and the common people are given a cut. These fictional heroes have one quality in common that makes many people identify with and revere them. People love these characters because they were winners. I've talked before about Philip K. Dick's book, Solar Lottery, whose characters ascribe great virtues to someone who's lucky or a winner, and it applies here. People overlook the darker actions of characters like Michael Corleone or Robin Hood and just assume that the victims were just people who deserved it, or more specifically, lived and died according to the rules of the game that had winners and losers. The Godfather book itself, as to say, how Mario Puzo told the story, is of particular interest. The narrative differs from the movie version in that the characters' thoughts and motives are described in more detail. It results in a story that has more emotional complexity, and there's a definite strain of black humor that runs throughout the book. There is a scene where one of the bosses, Clemenza, is saddened by the thought that the younger killers preferred the gun to the garrote, the strength of the victim. Puzo's narrative is perfect. It can be read as a quiet meditation about the loss of old virtues, or a satiric look at the civilized veil the gangster that put over the ruthless business. That expert mix of levels is reminiscent of an earlier classic, Dumas' The Three Musketeers, which was intended to be a funny satiric work, but now seen by many as a straight adventure tale that extols the virtues of chivalry and courage. It can be seen both ways, as Dumas' dry humor is from an earlier age that isn't obvious to modern readers. The Three Musketeers is a book full of people who extol the time-honored virtues, but often fall short in very human ways. Dumas gives the characters a lot of humanity. They aren't characters. We can see a little bit of us in D'Artagnan's attempt to become great. His motives are no different than a modern person trying to get ahead in life. So, what do the books have in common? Both feature characters who say they live by an inspiring code full of honor and courage, and who don't see the contradiction in their neighboring cheating, killing, and thievery. Of course, how could the characters do otherwise? They were created to entertain, and very few people pay money to see saints, who are often boring and annoying. It's not Puzo or Demoss' fault that their books are seen by some as some sort of ideal or reality. So in The Godfather, when Clemenza bemoans the lack of character in younger assassins, we may not agree, or even see it as black humor, but we can understand the concept that technology can lessen our humanity. The question in Clemenza's mind about how guns erode the old virtues could have another meaning. That is to say, the less humanity in any warlike activity, the more casual the cruelty becomes. There's another aspect of the book that's of interest. His depiction of women, which was different from the movie version. The Godfather films omit many of the storylines of women characters. One character, Lucy, is just seen as a quickie partner for Sonny Carl's known at the opening wedding scene and in fleeting moments after. In the book, she was not only Sonny's long-term mistress, but she goes on to have a very different life in Las Vegas after his death. Such characterizations wasn't because Puzo was a feminist, he was far from it, and in his now out-of-print collection of essays, The Godfather Papers, he made that very clear. However, he did see women as the same or sex, 
while men were off doing their criminal duty. Their homes and families were seen as the real world. The dawns dictum that men weren't real men unless they were involved with their families implied that. Puzo said in his essays that God was wise to entrust the task of having and raising children to women, as men would screw it up, which is arguably true. Motherhood is often regarded as a service sector job by traditional males, and their protection and support of a wife is conditional and subject to whim. His point was that most men prefer the world they've built, and most wouldn't sacrifice that for a child. Most macho dudes wouldn't live the life he imposed on women. Puzo's book expressed more truth than the movie because of the uncompromising portrayal of the mafia world, and in giving females hidden traits instead of making them into dolls and madonnas. It also showed where his sympathies actually lay, which was laid out more explicitly in his essays. Puzo never wanted to romanticize the mafia. That's what I see in the book. Like I said earlier, the Godfather is a layered work that people will see different things in, depending on their point of view. Whether you enjoy the adventures of gangsters, musketeers, or bandits who rob from the rich and give to the poor, it's good to keep in mind that projecting virtue on such archetypes inevitably leads to some absurdity. Masters like Puzo or Damas knew that, and it's a good writer who remembers to do the same thing. Some thoughts about John Steinbeck's Travels of Charlie and Jack Kerouac's The Road, based on an essay in my serial book, Classic Literature's Greatest Hits, which is available on Kindle Bella. Micah Clark wasn't the only adventure journey book that I read as a homeless person. I also read and reread Travels of Charlie by John Steinbeck and the reissue of Jack Kerouac's On the Road in the original scroll form and Jack London's The Road. All three are classic but each invoked a much different reaction than what might have occurred had my circumstances been less dire. The biggest disappointment was Travels of Charlie, a travelogue by Steinbeck who decided to see the real America what is brutal, at least from a homeless person's perspective. I thought a book about a guy and his dog roughing it on a cross-country trip would be full of insight into my situation, but it read like a slight tale about a very well-financed vacation. I refrained from calling it slummy, as Steinbeck appeared sincere in his desire to see the real America and talk to the salt of the earth. All of the fluffiness of Steinbeck's book could have been overlooked had it been more entertaining. Steinbeck was a wealthy man by this time, and the descriptions of his custom truck trailer, complete with liquor cabinets and his stays at various hotels, were so out of sync with my reality that it made me feel like Colin Mark. The book seems less trite for me now in 2024 after a few years of normalcy, and it might be worth rereading and developing a newer perspective about the work. I think it was mainly a book for Steinbeck fans, but in 2024, there are sections that van lifers and road gypsies could relate. Motel rooms were a real luxury for me in 2016, and were run by corporations that charged such high rates that one often had to choose between a bed and eating a full meal. I saw some people put all their available money into a room and then have the panhandle to get cash to eat, but most just went without a meal. The Kirok book was quite enjoyable, though a few decades after its debut, it's become a period piece, albeit a classic one. Kerouac allegedly typed the entire book out of a single roll of butcher paper, not even stopping the correct mistakes or doing the editing or revisions. It was in effect a stream of consciousness put the paper, though it did have a plot. I enjoyed the scroll version, as it's earthier, more spontaneous, and it doesn't hide the characters' real identities. It was an adventure book for its era and place, 50s America, though Europe had already seen writing like Kerouac had a freer sense of poetry and meter, and was influenced by American jazz. He was less mannered than James Joyce or Henry Miller, who were more disciplined as writers. The lack of editing does show, and it's an uneven book, with brilliant passages and some clunky sections that wouldn't inspire rereading. Yet it's hard to imagine how Kerouac could have produced his book in any other way, as any self-editing process would have filtered many of his best passages into a more correct structure as it's now clear that that's what happened in the original published version. Although the book was a chronicle of a trip across the United States, the real journey was in the author's mind as he attempted to create a new culture with its own language. For one thing, it's a young book, almost innocent in its enthusiasm, and very much about discovery. However, I later realized that my own homeless sojourn was also very much about discovery. Kerouac's writing was also fearless and honest, and those qualities will always be relevant to a writer. The Road by Jack London is a book I'm going to cover with its own episode. The reason being is it's actually a very influential book and actually spawned a movie. 
You've been listening to On the Road with Alan Ivey, a collection of literary essays, classic book talk, and humor from the works of Al Handa, Von Bella, X, and Kindle Unlimited. This close with some music by Mark McGraw. Thank you for listening.